But tonight I want to take one verse, one verse, and one phrase that's in there. We'll start in verse 21. The Bible says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And this we're just jumping in the pool here. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For there is no difference. There's no difference in the people that believe. Uh, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight. Why? Because there is no difference. Uh, rich or poor, uh, why? Because there is no difference. There is no difference. And that got me thinking, well, hold on a second. There's no difference between who God will save, right? The Lord is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Right. Everybody would be saved. God wants all to be saved. Right. Uh, he, he doesn't want mankind to die and go to hell. That is not His desire to send people to hell. However, it is His design to send sin to hell, to send unbelievers to hell, to send those who would reject his son, and in, 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 uh, in fact, reject him. No, you are not the God. No, I don't believe in you. God says, okay, I don't want you to have to go there, but since you chose, since you chose, then that's where you're going. So it says here, for there is no difference. We know there's no difference in whom the Lord will save. But there is a difference in the people that make it. The people that live out the Christian life. The people that seem to to just kind of hang in there when everything else is falling apart. And people that seem to continue to grow and people that fall off the wagon and, and, and uh, people that seem to, to continue to uh, uh, get through one struggle after another after another while some people buckle under their struggles and some people who seem to uh, get through the cancer treatments and get through the bankruptcy and get through the, the, the betrayal and get through the, the hard times and then others who buckle under all those different things. Both both Christians, both saints. You have saints and you have ain'ts. Amen. There's two kinds of people, saints and ain'ts. And um, uh, and if you are a saint, if you're a saint, you don't have to be on the ain't side. You don't have to fall into that category um, uh, on, on who makes it. Now, that what a wonderful question that is. Folks, now we're all made of the same stuff, aren't we? Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. It's funny, I was sewing with Brother Jerry yesterday. We were over here on New Haven Avenue. And uh, we were talking to uh, a couple of fellas called, um, uh, their name was uh, Zero. Zero, it was, funny, it was funny, we were walking around and Brother Jeff said, oh yeah, but uh, a zero was on the end. I said, no, it's not zero, it's zero. You gotta have to roll the off, Brother Jeff. Zero. Uh, yeah, Zero, Yuri, uh, Yuri, and um, uh, Jose. And they were talking to him, and it was funny, I said, and, and I brought this up, I said, but we, God has made all nations with one blood. He's made all nations, and I pulled out my knife. They kind of and I went, and I can cut myself. Blood will come. Red blood. I said, and if you take that knife and you cut yourself, red blood, red blood's going to come. Folks, we're all made of the same stuff. We're all made of the same stuff. But body, soul, and spirit. And all of us, the Bible says, all of us, the very next verse in 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every man in his best state is altogether empty, is altogether vanity. Uh, you could be the greatest philanthropist that ever lived and died without Jesus Christ, and you didn't—you pretty much did nothing. So you fed some people, so you housed some people, so you put some clothes over people's heads. You were just trying to take God's ability to provide those things. You die and go to hell. What does a man gain? The Bible says a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul. And what does he really get? Nothing. Nothing. What a terrible, terrible view. What a terrible deal. And by the way, God knows the deal. And he said, don't take that deal. I got a new deal for you. And most men say, no, don't need it. So we know from this portion of scripture, all men need to be saved. However, though, it's, it's, it's incredibly obvious. It's so obvious. And you have to be about as ob ob oblivious as um, a president reading a teleprompter. Uh, and you have to be about, it's obvious from personal experiences as well as from Scripture, uh, and you can just read the Scripture, um, that uh, some people succeed in living the Christian life, and some people don't. And I don't mean you, you failed in an area. I'm not, I'm not saying you fell down. I'm saying you abandoned shit. 
You turn your back and you say, no, I have decided not to follow Jesus. I have decided to go my own way and do my own thing. And the question is, is how? How do some people make it and some don't? Do some people just have like an extra blessing and a hedge on them from the Lord? I don't believe, I don't think so. I believe the hedge is built. I believe a, a blessing is procured over time through this thing called obedience. Uh, but some people live the Christian life and some fail. Some, some uh, saints become outstanding Christian and some fall by the wayside. Some are like Luke who stayed with Paul to the end. And some are like demons who love this present world and they, they, they leave. They leave. Uh, one of the hardest things that I've seen over time is a pastor who has... Uh, who has um, you know all the holes plugged, all the posts, uh, you know somebody he's got somebody on every watchtower, and 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 then people just say, well I don't want to do the watchtower anymore, I'm jumping off and going out there with the enemy. Uh, man, that's hard on a pastor, that's hard on a church, that's hard on the friends in the church, uh, where people are just like I'm not in it, I don't want to do it anymore. Well, people don't just decide to do that. It's a process that's been over time. I said it some years ago. People leave church months before they actually leave church. In some cases, years. You say, well, what do you mean by that? They left right here a long time ago. Right inside of here, right inside of here. They, they, they left so many times ago. And Demas, no telling how long Demas sat and heard the preaching and sat and had spiritual conversations with Paul and Luke and was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this. And one day he just has enough and he's like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. So in the, in, the, in the scripture for tonight, though, um, Mark is mentioned. Oh, let's see. Uh, well, I'll just keep that in my notes. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Mark in um, oh, it's Second Timothy, Second First Timothy. It's Second Timothy four nine through eleven. He talks about I got Mark with me. Uh, he mentions him as a disciple who had left Paul, but later returned and was profitable him for him in the ministry. He he left, but he came back. We have people like that. There will people. Listen, there are people who will who will have a moment of uh, uh, not de of, of, uh, of dementia, spiritual dementia. They'll 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 fall. They'll fall out, um, uh, and then and then they go, man, what's wrong with me? And they, they they get back to it. You got three kinds of people: those who never leave, those who those who leave and, and don't ever return, and those who get a wake up call or they come to their senses and get back in the yoke. But the difference, so you have to ask yourself, what's the difference? What's the difference? There is no difference for salvation. Let's get that nailed down now. For whosoever will may come, amen. Come unto me. Come unto me. Uh, uh, for whosoever, I love that, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. But if, there, if, if uh, there's no difference in who God will save, what is the difference in those who make it for Christ and those who make it in the Christian life and those who don't? And, uh, and there are many factors. I want you to understand that tonight. There's a whole lot that comes into play. But I want to give you some, some what I think are obvious observations of people who make it and people who don't. Number one, number one, why is it that some people make it and some don't? Number one, the difference is in the person's love of the Word of God. Your love in the Word of God. And I don't know how people can read the Bible and come across certain scriptures and it doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't give you goosebumps. It doesn't make the hair stand up on your neck. You don't smile. You don't cry. You don't laugh. You don't, you're not, you don't go, man, what a wonderful verse. You don't say, man, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. Amen. And you begin to think about yourself and say, man, I went astray. But the blood of Jesus Christ brought me back. The Savior left the 99 and he came out and he found me. And I still hold on to, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be, shall be, shall be. I can take some of the most mundane verses. And Pastor Jackson can take a mundane verse. And maybe you have a verse that means something to you. And it does something for you. It lights you up. It stirs you up. It gets you amped up. And then you go and you share that with somebody. And it just doesn't hit them the same. You're like, what's wrong with you? If that verse won't hit you, I will, you know. Uh, wake up, fool. Wake up. And I don't mean... Call, don't call your brother fool. I get, I know. Um, that's why I said fool. Uh, don't put the L on the end. We're all right. Uh, uh, but come on, man. Does that not excite you? Does a, a home in heaven? Man, that, that reading that of Second Peter, not First Peter, but Second Peter this morning, chapter three, where it talks about man, the elements will be burned up in the earth, also, and all the things that are in. 
That's scary, but at the same time, it causes rejoicing in me because I'm not going to be here for it. I won't be here. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Motivate me to be a soul winner so people aren't left behind, but also motivates me to rejoice because I won't be here to go through that, that, that trial and that tribulation, that horrible, fearful time. I won't be here for it. But, but a person's love of the Word of God, the Bible says in Psalms 1, 1 and 2, Blessed is the man, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now that blessed man, that blessed man, you know what he does with the word of God besides read it? He revive, revive oh, excuse me, rever, reveres it. He reveres it, which means he respects it. He looks to it and says, that means something. That book right there, that scripture right there, that means something to me. That means something to me. Not only does he revere it, but that blessed man is revived by it. Now, when you come into church and you hear the word of God preached, you ought to be revived by it. You ought to be revived by it. Uh, uh, if you're counting on a preacher to revive you, I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I don't know. I don't know that's... that's CPR. You say, what's that CPR? Spiritual CPR. All I know is this is what the Word of God says, and this is what I'm going to do. It's up to the Holy Spirit to revive you. Now, I'm not taking notes. I'm not saying I bear no responsibility. If I'm not read up, if I'm not prayed up, if I'm not fought up, if I'm not walked up with God during the week, then I shouldn't be standing up here preaching uh, and, and hoping to have an effect. Yeah, like, come on now. But man, you got to be able to start yourself up. You got to be a self starter when it comes to, 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 the, to the scriptures. If you're revived by it. Man, we sing, we sing our amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What is that? I, I, man, my sight was given back to me. I was laying dead. I was spiritually dead, and I was made alive. I'm revived by it. Hey, if, if, if um, what did Jesus say? Come unto me, all you that labor and are here to have me laden. I will give you rest. That right there, I look into that, and I go, man, I have somewhere. I've got a post to lean on. I've got, I've got a, a bed to sleep in. I've got a refuge. To run into and be be helped. I am revived by it. I'm revived by it. Not only is that man of Psalm 1, that blessed man, that blessed man, whom the Lord has no respect of persons. So anybody who will take the word of God and live and not only read it, but revere it and, and be revived by it, and then bless God. You listening back there, bless God. The blessed man reviews and remembers it. He's gonna review it. He's going to go back to it. You know, my, my dad said something uh, a couple weeks ago. He said, uh, you know, read the Bible through. It's a wonderful thing. He's like, oh, you ever just read a book over and over and over and over and over again? Just read it over and over and over again. I probably read First and Second uh, Peter this week six or seven times. You're going to get tired. You're like, Brother Jackson, when, when are you going to get out of Peter? Oh, man, that's why, that's why the Bible is so deep, so wide, so tall, so you, can, you can't encompass this whole thing. There's more truth in this book than all the other books put together in the world. It's, it just keeps going and going and going and going. It's an incredible, incredible book. You ought to review it and you ought to remember it. You ought to remember it. You ought to remember it. You ought to take God's word and put it in your heart. And then, man, you pull it out like a weapon when it needs to be pulled out. You pull it out and say, I, I'm able to pull this scripture out in this situation of my life because I remember the word of God. And many Christians, we fret and we frown and we, and we, and we, or, or we act foolish because we've not reviewed God's word and hid it in our heart. So what's the difference with people? What's the difference between a Christian who makes it and a Christian who doesn't? What's, between, what's the difference between somebody who seems to just keep going no matter how many times they're not down and somebody who just stays down. I'll tell you what, it's the love of the Word of God. The love of the Word of God. Now where do we all run to when we start getting congested and allergies and sick and all this? If we run to the medicine cabinet or we run to the doctor, we take we take what we're supposed to. Some of us may be different and whatnot. But um, uh, what do you do? Supplements. What do you do? Get rid of the virus. What do you do? Well, man, we, we all live this life together. We're all in this life together. Body, soul, spirit, flesh and blood, temptations, trials, tribulations, 
testing. We're all, we all experience those things. And when you come up against something, it ought to be the word of God that we reference. It ought to be the word of God that lives and breathes through us. The word of God. You're not going to make it if this book right here is just another book. If it's not even a book, well, I don't really like reading. Okay, says the person who has the Alex, Alexander Scorby CDs and doesn't listen to those either. Has the Bible app on their phone and they don't listen to that either. Come on. Come on. Your relationship with this book right here is going to determine a whole lot of what you receive up there. Yes, sir. Second Timothy 2 5, which leads me to my second point. What's the difference? The difference is in your relationship and your love for the Word of God. Secondly, the difference is in your person's dedication or your decision to the way of God. To the way of God. God says, I, man, I'm, I'm doing a study right now on the heart of God. The heart of God. The heart of God. The heart of God. David, a man after God's own heart. The heart of God. The heart of God has a way and it's righteousness. He says, I delight and justice and equity and, and righteousness. I delight in these things. These are the things that I delight in. But 2 Timothy 2, 2 5 says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Right. Now what does that mean? Do it God's way or don't do it at all. Do it God's way or don't do it at all. You're like, well, well, I feel like if I do godly things my own way, then, you know, I can preach the Word of God and, and do it in a very, you know, open and uh, uh, very accepting and very um, understanding way of all the different, uh, uh, it says the homo pastor somewhere downtown, accepting all that. And we're just showing God's love, you know, through the lens of, you know, being a queer. Man, Brother Jackson. No. God says, do it my way or don't do it at all. I do it the way I told you to do it. Because if you don't do it the way I want you to do it, if you don't do it the way that I told you to do it, then, then you might as well just not do it at all because uh, uh, it's, um, it's not approved. I don't approve of it. I don't approve. Do it lawfully. Strive for masteries. Yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. You got to do it within the rules of God's structure. If we say, "Well, I'm going to get out of, I'm going to do, I'm going to do uh, uh, good works, and I'm going to do the Lord's business, but I'm going to do it kind of my own way and add my own flavor to it," I'm not saying you can't have a personality, and I'm not saying that um, preferences um, uh, can't, aren't allowed in. But what I'm saying is, we can't go outside of that, outside of God's law, and say, um, "Deputize me, God. Deputize me to do Your work." And, and I look, God says, no, you, you have to get into the force in order for me to deputize you. You've got to get on the team in order for me to deputize you. I don't just give badges out to everybody. I don't just put everybody on the, on, on the, the spiritual police force, if you will. He says, you've got to do it lawfully. You've got to do it God's way. The way of God may not always seem profitable to people. See, what we want to do is we want to have the cushy, posh lifestyle here and all the blessings from God. And that doesn't always work that way. There, you're going to have to give some stuff up. You're going to have to say goodbye and don't look back. Shut the door and don't look back. Lock the door and don't open it again on that old wife. You say, yeah, but on that old wife, there was prosperity and popularity and money bags and freedom and a whole lot of happiness. And then where I am now, it, it seems lonely sometimes. It seems desolate sometimes. And the money is tight sometimes and, and most times. And, 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 and this and that and this and that. Yes, but at the end of the journey of doing it God's way, there's this thing called unending joy and peace that passes all understanding. Knowing that you're doing, knowing that you're doing things God's way. Hey, is marriage a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing. God made it. But don't go marrying it if you're a dude or marrying another dude because that's outside of God's fault. Don't go shacking up before you, you say, Brother, Brother Jackson, now you sound like one of them old independent fundamental acts. Come on. Dude. Cool. I'm all for it. I, I want to. Listen, I heard a preacher get up the other day, and he, um, he, he was making all the women in the auditorium say the word kitchen. Y'all say kitchen. Y'all say kitchen. Okay? That, I think that's out of bounds. I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to stand up and tell y'all. I think that's chauvinist, and I think it's wrong, and I don't care who says it. I don't care. I don't care who says it. 
It's wrong. It's me. It's wrong. It's wrong. Jesus Christ wouldn't have said it. Last I checked, the woman that was in the kitchen was Mary Magdalene when she first was Martha, and she should have been in the living room with Mary and Jesus. So women, come on out the kitchen and, and, and spend time with Jesus. Amen. That's good. That makes sense. Sermon number one over. All right, sermon number two. Back on track. And by the way, I mean, listen, women have a place and men have a place, but we got to do it God's way. We have to do it God's way. Women ain't in the kitchen. Women ain't. Women are not in the kitchen like they used to be because we've gotten out of God's way of doing things. And men are not doing all the things that they're supposed to do. Why? Because we got out of doing things God's way. Got out of doing it God's way. And God says, you want, you want to make a difference? You want to make it in the Christian life? You want to make it? As we read in Peter today where he said, for so an entrance, a grand entrance, an entrance into heaven, a great entrance into heaven will be ministered to you. Good. Then do it my way. A lot of Christians are going to get to heaven and be ashamed. You're going to be ashamed going, man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Oh man, what, what, what did you tell God? What did you say? What was it like when you were talking to him? What is it going to be? We're going to be scared. Scared. We're going to immediately have all kinds of regrets, all kinds of things, where we go, oh no, why didn't I, or I should have, sins of commission, sins of omission. A lot of Christians, we look at ourselves and go, well, I'm not partying, I'm not drinking, I'm not drinking and driving, I'm not hanging out with the wrong crowd, and, and um, you know, I go, I go to church on Sundays, and, you know, I read my proverb every day. Cool. So you're not doing sins of commission, but what about the sins of omission? Where God said do, and we don't. Now, you can sit here tonight, and, and ignorance, that's one thing, you can claim ignorance and say, man, I didn't even know. All right, well, a lot of people don't continue to know because they don't go to church long enough to find out. You go to church just one time hoping to get that band-aid on that little, that little what, cut that life gave you, and then you don't go back to church until the next time you get an hour. No, go to church free to thrive. Free to thrive. I think everybody's disillusioned. I think the devil's done a really good job tricking Christians thinking everybody gets this the same welcome package when you get into heaven. Here's your, you know, here's your, um, uh, uh, here's your, here's your, here's your heavenly flag. You know, here's your welfare, here's your heavenly welfare, welfare food card. Here's your, here's your home, here's your car. Here's everything you need. Here's your welcome package. Welcome to heaven. Well, the scriptures tell us over here, Peter at least, and I'm, of course, I'm cherry picking that one out. He said, for so an entrance into heaven, a great entrance into heaven will be ministered to you. But what did he say about a grand entrance? A wonderful entrance. He said, have these things and abound in them. Be diligent in them. Be diligent in growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why if we so an entrance into heaven will be ministered to you? Yeah. We think we're just going to live how we want, do what we want, say what we want, think what we want, sleep with who we want, drink what we want, think what we want, go where we want, and we get to go to heaven and God's like, oh, okay. No, no, you're going to know. A conscience will tell your conscience will tell you. Your conscience bears witness against you, or the Holy Spirit bears witness against you. And you're going, oh man, oh man, oh man. I think, listen, I think these guys on the wall, or down here on earth, are like, man, I tried, I tried, I did my best, you know. But heaven is so beautiful, so wonderful, so great, so clean, so pure that we get up there and we know the difference. And you go, man, I should have done more. I should have done more. What should fester in you, what should promote something in you called hate for sin. We should hate sin because what it does to us, it dulls our senses. It dulls our spirituality. It, um, it uh, destroys our compassion for others. Sin. Sin, where David said, cleanse me from secret faults. Man, sin is so invasive. Sin is so pervasive. And sin is so sneaky. that man, it gets in there. We don't even know it's there. See, I mean, you can clean your whole house, right? You clean the house, you wash everything down, you wipe everything down, you get everything. Yeah, did, you, did you take the drywall off the walls and get all the spiders and cobwebs out of there? No, you didn't. Why? Because what we usually do is clean up what everybody can see. We clean up what everybody can see. A lot of people do the kind of cleaning where you vacuum the hallway, but you don't take the hose to the vacuum and go along the baseboard and the edge. And that's, that's what sin does to us, right? Man, we cleaned up the hallway. 
We vacuumed all the stuff and all the dirt and all the flakes out of the hallway. But man, sin, they laugh at the door, amen. It's still there on the edges. It's in the nooks. It's in the crannies. And David said, cleanse me from secret faults. And then we can't. You can't and I can't be perfect. You can't and I can't get every little wrong and every little fault and every little blemish out of our life. But through the growing and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we can continue to cleanse deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Until that wonderful day where we get to go to heaven and we drop this, this uh, robe of sinful flesh and God gives us a, 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 a perfect body, a new body. But folks, we can't, we can't ever receive that entrance into heaven, that grand entrance into heaven, that great welcome into heaven. And by the way, I'm not saying you live a bad life and you get up to heaven and people are going to boo you. I'm not saying you show hey, Paul, and, Paul and Moses and you know, Abraham are over there having a cup of coffee going, boo, boo, what are you doing? You might feel that way, but they're not going to boo you. But man, boy, hey, you made it, you're here. It's great to see you, man, we've been waiting on you. Isn't that nice? You ever have a surprise party? You walk in and people are surprised. You, hey, happy birthday. It's the difference between walking into the house on your birthday where people are just like, yeah. And walking into the house where like, hey, we got you some cake. Here you go. Just ice cream. Happy birthday. Man, Brother Jackson, come on now. You're saying stuff that's not really in the Bible. Um, saying stuff that's not in the Bible is my forte. No. Um, uh, Justin's going, uh, <laughs> but it's the way of God. Not just, not just the thought of God, but it's the word of God and the way of God. The way of God. Now folks, you may, you, 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 the way of God's not always easy. And it, it, and, it, and it may not always seem profitable. It may not always be something that's profitable right off the bat. You may have to pro uh, refuse a promotion. You may have to refuse being relocated. Hey, we'll relocate you and pay you six figures and, you know, uh, set you up with all these different things. And wow, it sounds tempting, but you may have to say no. You may have to say no. Uh, just to use that example very quickly again, when I became the pastor, um, and I quit driving a truck and I thought, uh, okay, well, and we had enough, you know, we had savings and different things like that. And, and then I had an offer to go up to Michigan last harvest and work up there for, I don't know what it was like eight weeks, six, eight weeks, something like that, do it harvesting and whatnot, and the money was ridiculous. Like, but, like that's what doctors make, you know? I just, I, okay, I, I really have to think about that. Uh, the need for money wanted me to go. Uh, but um, I didn't think the Lord wanted me to go. You see, there'll always be temptation. It was not the way of God for me to go. God did not want me to go. So I did not go. And you have to, man, before you jump on a promotion, before you jump on a jet plane and leave somewhere to take some other thing somewhere, you better, you better, you better clear it with God. You may have to refuse to take that transfer and that promotion. You may have to refuse to take a job that will put you in a, uh, a better financially uh, financial position. But bless God, it has just compromised your spirituality. It's just compromised your principles. The Lord tells us to be planted and be planted, or if you will, rooted, rooted where, where the people of God are, near the people of God, in the word of God. We don't have permission to uproot ourselves. We don't have permission to do that. We can't leave unless God gives the clear. Now, the way of God may not always seem um, um, uh, uh, profitable, and then neither is it popular. Popular. Uh, the way of the world is nearly... Um, <laughs> always against the way of God. Usually always against the way of God. Unsaved people, they're not going to go God's way. Most Christians in America are going the way of the world. We go the way of the world. Uh, you know, uh, uh, vulgar movies come out, we watch those. New, new slang and vernacular comes out and the Christian kids pick up on it. Um, uh, you know, uh, the latest, the latest trends, the latest fashions, uh, we all pick up on them. We, we go with them. The headlines, what's the, what's the newest headline? Anybody that know the newest headline in politics? Somebody tell them. Luke? Uh, Biden is not going to race for president. Yeah, he's stepping down. I'm, I won't be the candidate. I'm going to step aside. All right, okay, so there you go. And we run with that. We run with that. 
We run with the assassination. We run with, I didn't, oh, Biden has COVID. I didn't even know that. Um, uh, but uh, most Christians in America are going the way of the world. We're talking like them, dressing like them, acting like them, thinking like them. Uh, and, and, and it shows. It shows in our behavior. Now, the way of God may not always be profitable, not always popular, and um, <laughs> it uh, doesn't always seem possible. Always, it doesn't always seem possible. Um, uh, but uh, I love the scripture that I'm reminded by that says, our ways are not his ways. Amen. <laughs> our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. So what looks impossible to us is very possible to God. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You may say, that doesn't seem possible to me. I don't know that I'll ever be able to do something like that. I don't know that I would ever be able to follow a call of God. Listen, you don't even have to ask yourself that. If God calls, you'll follow. Or you won't. And your life will tell the difference. If you don't follow the call of God, your life will tell the difference one way or the other, but it will all be worked out at the judgment seat of Christ. I tell you today, don't look at the life of others and see the, the stockpile of stuff that they have. They, they can't, and I'm talking about Christian brethren. Where you look at them and go, wow, nice house, nice car, nice clothes, nice vacation. They seem so happy. Folks, stop judging someone's life on the 30-second reels that you watch on, Insta on Instagram. Okay, because when the cameras are off and um, the husband and wife don't talk to each other or they treat each other like garbage and the kids scream and and cussing mom and dad and slam the door and dad's a weakling and mom is um uh, you know uh, uh, what's a derogatory word I can come up with that would be me uh, dad's a coward and mom's a, a, a I got all kinds of words running through my head and I don't want to say one of them she's not right with God either kids aren't going to be right with God either the home's not right with God so you look at all the frills you look at all the oh look life is wonderful and by the way, not, not, not every story is that. Not everybody's life that you view is, you know, good on camera and, you know, hell on earth when the camera's off. Please understand there's a balance in it. There's, a, there's, a, there's that balance that everybody has. But you have no idea how close people are to falling apart. You have no idea how, how, who's running from God and who's not. The judgment seat is going to tell all. And I'm not saying we get up there and go, ha ha, I knew it. No, of course not. Because anybody that doesn't have a life well lived for Christ is robbing God of glory and robbing Jesus of rewards given back to him. And we ought to want the Savior of all creation, the God of all glory, the Jesus Christ who shed his blood for all sinners. We should want him to get all praise and all glory and all honor. We ought to want him to, we ought to, want to give him the best, the best. And there are some people who have nothing else to give. So we look at that and say, I can't serve God. I can't follow the call. I, the serving God and the way of God seems impossible. What looks impossible to us is possible to God, though. And with God, all things are possible. God specializes in doing the impossible. Creation was impossible, and yet God did it. The parting of the sea was impossible, and yet God did it. The uh, uh, Joshua and the halting of the sun was impossible, and God did it. The virgin birth of Christ was impossible, and yet God did it. The miracles of Jesus were impossible, yet God did it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was impossible, yet God did it. So I say, praise God, He did them all, and when you need a miracle, God can do it for you too. God can do it for you too. So when you say, I can't do it, that seems impossible. Remember, the God that you put your trust in specializes in the impossible. Right. So what makes the difference? There is no difference for people who want to be saved. There's no difference. There's no difference. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. There's no difference if you want to be saved. No difference. From a man from Tabasco, Mexico, he can be born again. Then a guy from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan can be saved. And everybody across the globe, there's no difference. There's no difference. But why is it that a guy from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, he, he can live for Christ, and a guy from Tabasco, Mexico can't? 
And why is it that a guy from, um, you know, uh, L.A. won't make it for Christ, but a guy from, uh, you know, whatever, um, what was that place I went, had a really weird name in New York. Doesn't matter. New York, New York. How about that? He, that Christian can make it. And vice versa and so on and so forth. What makes the difference with them? Well, the Word of God, the way of God, and lastly, lastly, what is your, the, the, the difference that is made is the person's desire for the wisdom of God. The desire for the wisdom of God. James 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. If any of you lack wisdom, and you say, I don't really know, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Folks, we have to avoid the way of the world. The more we listen to the world, the more it the blesses the man who what? Standeth, who standeth not in the way of sinners. Who, who doesn't receive the counsel of the ungodly, right? So there's the ungodly, the sinners, and, and, and the, 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 the scorners. So God says, don't get your counsel. Don't get your wisdom for the things that you need from ungodly people. Don't get it from ungodly people. But don't stand in the way of sinners. You go, no, we ought to stand in the way of sinners, amen? No, it, no that, that verse doesn't mean in opposition of, it means in cahoots with. Don't go with the sinners. Don't stand in the way with the sinners because uh, usually they're standing in the way of an oncoming train. Don't stand on the train tracks because the train is coming and you will get hit. God says don't stand in the way with sinners. Don't, don't do it. You're, 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 uh, you're going to hurt yourself. So we must avoid the way of the world. Jeremiah 10, 22. Uh, or 10, 2. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the heathen. We ought not know where the red light district is in Fort Wayne. Now, I know some things just come down through the, you know, through the telephone line, and you learn, if you live in a city long enough, you kind of learn. But you ought not learn out of inquisitiveness. Uh, uh, you say the red light district, what's that? That's, um, that's where you go to meet people for um, things the police would arrest you for. All right, let's put it that way. We have some young ears in here. Uh, so, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the heathen. Christians ought not know how to mix drinks. Christians, I'll say this, Christians ought not be bartenders. People who are born again should not be bartenders. There's a curse on you for doing that. There's a curse on you, a special curse on you for giving your neighbor drink. And, and not only a curse, but shame on you. Yes, sir. Shame on you. We ought not know the latest gossip on people. We ought not know these things. We ought not know things about people besides I've taken their name to God in prayer. We ought not learn the way of the heathen. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. How is it that they deceive us? I'll tell you how. Through philosophy, tradition, and the rudiments of the, the tools, the assets, the, the understandings of the world. That's how. Learn not the way of the heathen. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And then Proverbs 14, 7 says, Go from the presence of a foolish man, when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Man, I've been in conversations with people before, and it's like, you'd be better off trying to have a conversation with an orangutan. You'd be off go better off going to the zoo and making eye contact with the gorillas and thinking, I think he likes me, than having a conversation with the, the, the fool of Proverbs 14. I've had conversations with people before, and all they're talking is a bunch of garbage, just the vanity and the, the bunch of nothingness of life. Garbage. Foolish. Foolish. When it says, when thou perceivest, not in him the lips of knowledge. So we have to ask for wisdom from heaven. Now what do we got to do? We got to follow Solomon's example. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You get wisdom from God's word. You get wisdom from God's word. You get experience in that wisdom, using that wisdom in the way of God. You get wisdom from being around those who have wisdom. You get wisdom from being around people who 
have wisdom. I've seen things on social media where they're like, um, um, you know, I, I feel much dumber after reading your comment. You know, uh, different things like that. Hit that right there. You perceive in him uh, uh, that he doesn't have the lips of knowledge. He doesn't have understanding. Well, maybe you can get around certain people and know these people, this guy, this lady, this these gentlemen, they know their stuff. But I can tell that they, they've been around the block. They can see around the corner. They, they, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're talking about. And any young person would be wise, would show their wisdom by who it is that they hang out with. You get wisdom from being around those who have wisdom. Now you say, Brother Jack, I'm not really interested in having wisdom. All right, well then you're disobeying the Bible because the Bible says get wisdom. Get wisdom. And with all like getting what? Get understanding, right? Get wisdom. Get wisdom. Get it. You have to get it. Get it. I want you to go get it. Well, we're supposed to do it then. Get wisdom. We have to apply God's word to our hearts, folks. In order to, to live out and show wisdom, we, in order to get wisdom, we have to get in God's word. We have to apply, our, and apply it to our heart. Now, it's shown by your choice of a church. A lot of people in Fort Wayne are going to these um, uh, non-denominational um, uh, walk out feeling good every service, uh, every, every service type of churches. Nothing wrong with feeling good. Um, uh, and um, uh, feeling good coming from the Bible. I just told you earlier that you can be revived from it. You can revere it and be revived and relieved and all kinds of different things from the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with feeling good. But um, a wisdom and your, your, your dedication to the way of God is going to be shown through the kind of church you attend, your faithfulness to the church services, your prayer life, the time you spend in God's Word, your, your attentiveness to the preaching and the teaching of the book. You've got to lock in with it. You've got to get lock, stop, uh, 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 and lock step with it. The Word, the way, and wisdom. Why? For what purpose? What, why should we do these things? So, so we can fall into the category of James chapter 2 where we're, we're adding good works to our faith. Obviously, of course, not for salvation, but we're, we're adding good works. Is that what we're trying to do? Is it for salvation? Brother Jackson, what are we trying to do? Because it's the will of God. God's will wants to be done. God's will must be done. The Bible says in Psalm 84, verse 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, find, folks, find and do, finding and doing the will of God will generate success. Finding and doing the will of God will determine this success for you. you. To find the will of God, though, it means find, find what I'm supposed to be doing. What am I supposed to be doing? When am I supposed to be doing it? And where am I supposed to be doing it? All right, for me, just for an example, uh, the right thing to do, uh, the right the right task would be uh, the task of being a pastor, the task of being a husband, the task of being a father, the task of being a friend. God want, God has a will for me in those things. And I'm supposed to emulate or show, mirror Christ in all of those different scenarios. And, and so on and so forth, so many others. All right, well, when am I supposed to do it? Well... Kind of like all the time. You know how the scriptures tell us in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing? Pray without ceasing. There's no on and off switch for trying to mirror Christ. There's no on and off switch. You're supposed to try to mirror Christ all the time. And we're supposed to do it in the right place. The right place. The right place. You say, man, I went soul winning this, this week, Brother Jake. Oh, yeah, where, where, where'd you go? Well, I went to Shooter's Bar. I went in and had a couple of drinks and I shared the gospel with everybody. No. No. If you want to go outside, go in the parking lot or something. Okay, maybe. Maybe. Um, you know, like, yeah, we went to we went to Pierre's, man. We had a great time for a birthday party and we gave gospel tracts up, you know, all kinds of people. Okay, I don't I don't suggest you do that. And if you do that, please don't tell me that you did. Just don't tell me. I'm sure I'll see you on Facebook. Don't, don't tell me you did it. Don't tell me. Uh, let the church member who's bitter against you find out and come tell me. And then I'll tell them. And then I'll tell them, do you have another witness? And they'll say, no, but I saw. And then we're going to want to show me pictures. And I'll say, oh, so you were there too? 
I know how that thing goes. Um, but to find the right task, the right task is being a soul winner. The right task is, oh, but what is the golden rule? The royal law that James said? Love thy neighbor as thyself. You do that all the time. You should do that all the time. If you really hate your neighbors, the best way to get back at them is by loving them. That's why I moved to where I have no neighbors. Find the right time. Admit Miss White. I had no problem loving Mrs. White and moving next door to me. Tried to witness to our neighbors. He was a moving guy and he did all he worked real hard, but he smoked a lot and he drank a lot. He was 40, 42 years old and died of a heart attack in, I think, Connecticut. Um, in a moving company. I, I remember staying in his backyard, cutting down a tree, gave him the gospel. And he said, Oh man, I believe there's something up there. And I said, No, dude, it's not a something. It's a someone. And it's God. His son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for all the yeah, world. Okay, dude. Okay. And now, now, unless some other soul winner got to him, he's in hell. You can't go through life going, oh, I think there's something up there. You're right, there is something up there, but you can, you can know who, who it is and what it is. But finding the will of God. Finding the will of God. What is the will of God? Everybody's so worried about the will of God. Oh, the will of God. I was a teenager, went to all these conferences, all these camp meetings all the time. I was so concerned. Okay, I won't be doing the will of God until he calls me to do some big thing. No. No. You know, the biggest will that God has for you is for you to walk and talk and have fellowship with him on a daily basis. Why is it that some people make it and some people don't? Why is it that some people, man, they just seem to just keep going for God and others don't. I wonder if people in this room tonight, you have an expiration tag on your on your Christianity. You don't have it on your salvation. You're born again. You get, there is no difference. There is no difference. Here, I, I want all to be saved. All right, well, what about all those that get saved? They just don't all, they just don't all turn out for the Lord. And not anybody should sit in here and say, I've turned out for the Lord. So far you have. Right? Miss, Miss White, so far. Brother Kevin, so far. Dad, so far. Dr. and Mrs. Polazzi, so far. So far. And from what I know, they have no plans on quitting. They have no plans on quitting. They're like, hey, we've been at it long enough. We're going to keep at it. Or, I've been at it long enough, and I don't have all the things that I want. And I just feel like I've been, um, I haven't been treated as fairly. I feel like I haven't, God hasn't uh, uh, given me all that I desire. So, you know what? Hang it, I'm out of here. I don't think anybody becomes, very few people become full of animosity and hatred toward God. From my view of my generation, a lot of it has been, I mean, the world becomes very attractive. It becomes very attractive, more and more and more attractive. It's busy, 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 busy. And it pulls you away. It pulls you away from, uh, from walking with the Lord. And it happens, by the way, it doesn't happen just to independent Baptists. Have us all kinds of guys like today, um, Jamie. Fast food's no good for you, but I went and got a Whopper. Jamie bought me a Whopper, and the guy opened the window. He goes, "It's nice to see people still dress up for church." And he said something about where he goes to church and uh, raised on um, German Lutheran. I said, "So you know Martin Luther?" No. Uh, so he and uh, I said, "Well, what do you? It's Sunday. Why are you not in church? It's Sunday. Why are you not in church?" You know, it's, it's people all the time. Oh, church, everybody's got an opinion on church and God and heaven and hell and all these things. But we don't, we don't invest our lives into it like we should. Why do some people make it and some people don't? Those main factors. The word of God. The way of God. The wisdom of God. Four factors. The will of God. The will of God. And what, what are you deciding to do? What are you going to do? What are we going to do? Are you going to turn out? Luke, are you going to turn out? Houston, are you going to turn out? Lincoln, are you going to turn out? Grace and Abby, are you going to turn out? Uh, who's this? Is that Leah? Leah and Meg, are you going to turn out? I know you guys are young adults, but are you going to turn out? Carrie, are you going to turn out? Jeff and Brianna, are you going to turn out? Jake, are you going to turn out? Aaron, picking on everybody else. Are you going to turn out for the Lord? you got to decide to do it, and if you want to do it, Get in that book right there. Get in that book right there. Amen. Read it. Love it. Live it. Obey it. 
this book. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. This book will keep you from destruction and sadness at the judgment. Or, this book will keep you from sadness at the judgment. So staying away from this book, it will keep you from joy and the peace that God has to extend, the blessings that come with it, the promises of God. This book will keep you shielded and safe from all the destruction that's coming. Or, the negligence of that book will hasten our destruction. Will hasten the hurt. I have several, several men in particular that I can call their names right now. Now, they don't go to this church. Some used to. Um, well, they all used to. I could call their names and say, man, your life is evidence of your relationship with the book, the ways of God, the lack of wisdom, and the will of God. And not from a judgment, not from a judgmental standpoint, but from a judgment as an evaluation standpoint. Looking and saying, man, don't you want all that to stop? Yeah, I do. Okay, well, the word, the way, the wisdom, and the will. Bro, get doing what you're supposed to be doing. But you can't, I'm telling you right now, you can't control anybody else. You can't speak for anybody else. You will answer for you. You will answer for yourself. You'll be all alone. I sure hope it's that way anyway. I sure hope the judgment is behind closed doors. Just me and God. I don't think it is. I think it's full of witnesses, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, uh, and oh man, folks, it's coming. One way or another, are we ready for it? Are we living for it? Looking for the things to come. Heavenly Father, I, I, I come to you tonight. We come to you tonight. I ask that you help us. And I know I ask that a lot, Heavenly Father. But Lord, we need it. We can't, we can't do all these things on our own. There is no place in life that we are self-sufficient. Or at least we shouldn't be. We should, we should depend on you for everything. And not in a... Um, a little crybaby type of a way, like give us what we want. But just, I mean, Lord, dependent, excuse me, just dependent upon you. Just desirous that you would you feed us and you, 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 you uh, clothe us, that you uh, take care of us, provide for us as our Heavenly Father. Uh, and, and Lord, I, I don't think anybody in here wants to fail. Everybody in this room has fallen uh, and I believe everybody in this room has gotten back up. And Lord, we probably will fall again in some, some fashion. Some, sometimes we fall harder and further than other times. Uh, but Lord, we want to get back up. I don't think one person here says, yeah, I want to fail the Christian life. I want to fail it. And not one person, I believe, would even consider thinking that. Lord, we all want to make it. What makes the difference? Lord, thank you that your word makes a difference. And that your way makes a difference. And that your wisdom sheds light on things that are hard to see and understand. And that your will always is meant for good. Your will is always, always uh, profitable. Now, Lord, we, we walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, I, many people in this room tonight are praying certain prayers by faith. Lord, I ask that you would make their faith sight by answering their prayers. Lord, many people carry a burden. I'd ask that you'd help them to bring it to you to make it light. Oh, Father, we need you. Our church needs you. Our families need you. Help us to get into your word. Guide us to a place, Heavenly Father. Each person in here tonight, I would ask that you would put a book, put a verse, put a portion of scripture in their heart or their mind that they feel led to read or to memorize, but just to soak their soul in. Heavenly Father, reveal yourself through your word to us. Answer our prayers. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.